Okay, so what I'd like you to do, I've got this question up on the board. How do you make decisions in diff difficult ethical situations? And you guys have been in some already. You've been in, in cases where you weren't quite sure what the right thing was to do, but eventually you, you, did, you did something. You figured something out, right? Uh, you may have been tempted to do something and you knew it was wrong, or you actually got into a moral dilemma where it seemed like no matter what you did, you were, you were doing the wrong thing and you really wanted to do the right thing, but you couldn't see your way out. Think for a couple minutes, well, not a couple minutes, just a, a few moments actually, about what you, at present, I'm not saying what you ought to rely on, I'm, I'm interested in what you actually do rely on. How do you make these decisions? And I'd like you to write down just three things. Um, so think about past decisions that you made, um, important ones. Right? And what went into that? And write down three resources. And I don't mean resources like you went and, and looked it up in the library or something like that. I mean like anything that helped you. Anything that you found helped you resolve that situation and come to some sort of decision. There's a reason we're doing this, which, which you'll, you'll see as we go through the, the stuff about the allegory of the cave. Then what we're going to do is we'll just pick people randomly and you can tell me what your three are. And as we go through them, I, I would also like to see who has things similar to that. So if they say something and I put it up on the board, raise your hand if you've got something along the same sort of lines. So if they say feelings, and you put down emotions or desires, you'd raise your hand. Right? So let's start with, with Ms. Garrett. What do you, what do you have? Um, but looked at what the best outcome would be for all those involved. Okay. Um, Looking at <coughs> best outcome for all involved. Okay, how many of you had something like that? Okay, good. Uh, Cullen, right? Yes. Um, what was the next one you had? What were my feelings? Feelings, okay. So, who had. Anything like feelings or emotions? Um, did anyone have something like gut feelings or you just have kind of a hunch or anything like that? Okay, so we can put down, what would we call it, a hunch or? Intuition. Okay, intuition, yeah. You, you have a sort of sense about things and you can't articulate it that well. Sometimes that's reliable. Um, well, this is a little bit of a digression, but it, all of you know I used to teach at a maximum security prison, right? And um, some of the people there are really bad people, and some of the people there are, you know, more or less in between, and they've done some bad things, and then some of them are actually quite good people, because they've, they've changed over time in, in the prison. And there are certain people who creep you out. You know that feeling that you, you get being with some people, and you can tell there's something really off. You should not trust this person. You should not do anything with this person. Um, you should trust that. Unless you have it for everybody, in which case you've got a psychological problem. Um, but in most cases, you should trust that. Because, bless you, that does actually tend to be fairly reliable. The other case would be if you, if you, you find yourself only feeling that towards people of a certain race or certain class or nationality, then you've probably got a, a bias problem, right? But if you're feeling it and, it and it's just sort of popping up, don't walk down the dark alley with that person. 
Don't go home with that person. Because your intuition often does tell you when something's wrong. Um, what else? What else do you have? Ask for help. What's up? Ask for help. Ask for help. Okay. So let's call that um, other people. Other people and their ideas. How many of you had something like that? Consulting it. Wow, almost everybody. That's pretty good. Um, Ms. Santiago, did you have any other ones besides um, these three? Not really. I had like listen to music and think about it, but that's kind of like contemplate. Um, that's kind of an interesting one though. Listen to music and think about it. So, what does listening to the music do for you? I don't know, just focus on something else so you can't focus on Let, everything else. Let's call that, let's broaden that, and we'll call that um, practices for focusing or maybe relaxing. Sometimes you, you, you need to like declutter things. Um, focusing or relaxing. Okay. Um, it could be music. Some people do that with meditation or prayer. Uh, some people, you know, we've got this metaphor, go to your safe place inside your head. You know, it might be a waterfall or pine forest or something like that. But if that helps you, that could be a resource, right? Um, when you said music, I, I actually thought, um, uh, you know, a lot of people get their ideas about, about things from songs, which probably isn't a great idea. Think about love songs, right? You know, there, there are probably some love songs that are helpful in making ethical decisions, but uh, most of them are, are probably in the studio wrong, you know. I love you so much, so even though you, tr you treat me bad, I'm always going to be there for you, you know. Um, not because, you know, that's the right thing to do, but because I need you so bad, baby. You know, that, that, is, is that, a, is that a, a good way to, to behave and act? Sounds good when you put, you know, a whole bunch of instruments behind it, somebody has a great voice. Um, but is that a reliable guide for running your life? Probably not. So, um, what else do you guys use? Yeah. Uh, like values or beliefs. Okay. Get this broad thing of values. Um, what do you mean by beliefs? Like values along like beliefs, like you know, you don't do something because you believe it's wrong, or okay. You know, you, so like let's say um, like me and my friends are, well, I don't know, let's say uh, fighting over a girl. I have yeah. a belief that I don't you know, get involved with girl, girls that my friends are talking to, so that's like my personal belief. Okay, so that could be, what you're talking about there is something like a rule or a principle. Yeah. You can, and you can express it as such. I, um, if my friends are involved with a girl, I'm not going to mess with her. And, you know, I'm not going to talk with her. I'm, not, I'm going to, you know, back off. That's something you can express as, as a sort of principle. Um, okay, so this, this is a good list. And who else had anything like that? Like, like a, a, a belief, a principle, a value? Anybody? I hope some of you did. No? What, what, are, what are some of the other things that you guys had that weren't on here so far? Anybody? Yeah. Like, reflect on passive experiences. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So not just like looking ahead at the outcome, but looking at past experience, how things panned out before. Learning, learning lessons very often. Best thing to do with painful things like that is to learn other people's lessons by their experience, watching them screw up. Uh, but often, you know, we have to learn through our own failures. Um, I'll give you an example of that in just a few minutes. Personal example. But any any other things that Carnell wants to add? I thought that I would um, think of the 
advice I would give to someone if they were in my situation? Because I feel like it's sure. rationalizing for ourselves. That's interesting. Um, I'm running out of room. Let's put that over here. Um, how should we express that? Um, think about how it would be for someone else. Making that decision. So that that's these are actually these two were very interesting because later on this semester we're going to talk about a moral theory called utilitarianism. And utilitarianism holds that the way that you should make ethical decisions is you should think about outcomes and pick the outcome that is best for all the people involved as much as you can. So, I mean, there are some things that it will go along with. Like if I could impose horrible pain on one person in this classroom and all the rest of us would, would really you know, get a lot of pleasure out of that, utilitarianism would say, well, the good of the many outweighs the good of the the one or the few, so that's okay. There are some problems with that, but this idea of looking to not just yourself, you know, you think about Thrasymachus and egoism, you know, you don't just look at yourself, you look at all the people that are involved, that's, that's an ethical principle, that, that um, is part of the moral theory. This notion of thinking how it would be not for just yourself, but if somebody else were to do it, that's another moral principle or rule to, to guide you. And that's a pretty good one. You know? Later on we're going to look at um, a guy named Immanuel Kant. And Kant, his, his moral theory is called deontology. And part of that is what it's about universalization. Can you universalize it? Can you say, well, not just in my case, but in everybody else's case, they should act this way. So if you can give the advice to somebody um, well, you should behave this way because it would be a good thing for you to do in this situation. And you take yourself out of the picture, which I take it as what you're talking about here. You're already sort of taking on a, a uh, portion of a moral theory that we're going to look at this semester. Okay, so you've got all these different things. And how do you actually make decisions in, in real cases? If you have a lot of time to think about it, you may bring a lot of things to bear. Sometimes you have to make your decisions right away, um, and, and that can be, uh, you know, good or bad, depending on how well prepared you are for making those decisions. Um, one of the things that we, we didn't put up here, because I think you don't think about it that often, is, you know, this notion of the virtues, um, your character. Your, your habits, your disposition towards things. And those could involve these, and those could um, require you to do some of these things. Like you could have a habit of always looking at how it affects everybody else, or thinking about how it would be if it wasn't you doing it, but somebody else doing it. You might also have a habit of just relying on your, on your feelings. Sometimes your feelings can actually be good guides. Sometimes they're not. I think you all have experience with that, right? Um, I'll give you my example now in this, place, in this case. I used to be a very aggressive arguer. Um, remember how last class we were talking about the parts of the soul and you know the reason and the spirited part and the appetites? Um, I've, I've not had so much of a problem in my life with the appetites. Uh, you know, I eat too much, but that's not so much about it. Um, it's been with the spirited part of the soul. You know, that part that wants to get honor. That part, the part that wants to be better than everybody else. Um, the part that gets angry. And I would be very angry when I would argue with people. And it would actually, I was very good at arguing. You know, I had a good intellect, and, but I used it in, the, in, in wrong ways. And so I hurt a lot of people. I actually drove one graduate student away from considering the school that I was at. Um, I was so bad when it came to that, they actually coined a, uh, a verb to saddlerize. 
which meant to get into an argument with somebody and just totally, you know, go after the throat and demolish them. Um, and, you know, what got me to stop doing that? You know, people started telling me, you're a jerk. Um, when, when it comes, and, and deciding how to argue with somebody, that's a decision. You, you don't have to do that. I didn't have to do that. I could, you know, justify it and say things like, well, I'm pursuing the truth, and, you know, if they can't stand up to it, then, then, then they really shouldn't be doing philosophy anyway. You can always come up with lots of justifications, can't you, for any sort of thing you want to do. The question is, are they actually good justifications? And what actually ended up doing it for me was feelings, emotions. Realizing that, uh, you know, I was affecting other people, so there's this looking at the good of other people involved, but I felt bad. You know, that, that's, that regret that you have after making a bad decision, that can sometimes be a very good guide. You could also have regret for the wrong things, too, don't People do that, don't they? Um, so it, emotion may not be the best guide, but it can be sometimes a good guide. Other people. Other people are kind of a sounding board. If other people are telling you you're a jerk, and they do it consistently, you probably should look at your behavior. Right? If they're telling you that you're doing the right thing, you know, maybe some of them are flattering you, or you know, you know, all sorts of very ripe metaphors for that sort of thing. I'm not going to use any of them, um, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, maybe sometimes it's, it's false, but but a lot of times other people are a good way of telling um, what we need to do. Plato is really going to be much more interested in this realm of values. He's going to think that those and the virtues put all these other things into perspective. So this brings us to this allegory of the cave. Um, and to go back to something that we looked at earlier in the semester, you remember when we read Alistair McIntyre, that first essay, that um, a lot of you, you know, found kind of difficult, right? Because there's a lot of material there. One of the things that you might have passed over, when he was talking about stories, he was saying, all of you have a story, right? You're still developing your story. And our stories intersect a little bit. Your stories intersect with your, your classmates, but we all have different stories. And then he says, there's certain stories that everybody should read. And they're not your story yet. Until you read them, and you assimilate them, and maybe you have you know, sort of a back and forth conversation with that story. And he talks about different things. I, I forget exactly. He's got, he's got a thing for things Irish. So he's got um, some Irish stories in there. And I think he had the Iliad. Um, well, this story about the, the cave, this is one of those stories. This is one of those, those things that you should run into during college because it's part of a liberal arts education. And it helps you figure out, what are you actually doing here? What's the point of being here in college and doing all this study? I mean, you're preparing for careers. That's important, right? Some of you are here because um, you're, you're, you know, you're training your body, you're doing athletics, you're benefiting the college. Um, some of you are here because you, you know, just genuinely enjoy learning and you did well in high school and you said, I, I'm going to go to college and take some classes and I'm not going to take the classes that they all told me I have to take in high school anymore. I'm going to take what I want to take, right? But what is the purpose here? What's the larger purpose? It's for you to become educated. And so you can ask yourself, what does that mean? What is the process of education? This is where this allegory of the cave is a very powerful story. And what's an allegory? An allegory is sort of like a parable. It is a story. What kind of story? Is it supposed to be realistic? Is it like a case file? A case of Ms. Wren. You know, such and such, one on this day. It's not like that, is it? Go ahead. Ooh, sorry. It's a 
It's a, a metaphor. Okay, so it's a kind of metaphor. And when we, we use this term metaphor, what we mean is it's not literally true, but it's revealing something to us that may be true on a deeper level. So if I say, um, you know, classic metaphor, um, if I haven't had my coffee, I'm a real bear in the morning. I'm not hairy like a bear or, you know, big and strong. I am big, but I'm not really that strong like a bear. Um, and uh, I don't have huge teeth, you know. I also don't have any sort of feral instinct to rip things apart. Um, but you understand what I'm saying when I, I say that because I don't have this thing that I need to keep me going. Um, I'm a bear. What does it mean? It means that I'm irritable, irrational, maybe clumsy a bit. You know, bears are not, are not you know, you don't have bears doing precision work, right? <laughs> They're mainly made for doing big things. Um, well, on a deeper level, that, that's true. Now think about parables. Think about um, stories that you, you've heard from, you know, this or that thing in the Bible, right? Um, I used to teach religious studies classes, and I'd have these students, because I'd teach, you know, Old Testament and New Testament and all that, and this was back in the prison, and they would say stuff like, you know, where did Cain get his wife from? You know, there's just Adam and Eve, and, and you know, Cain and Abel, and then Cain kills Abel, and uh, this is before they have another kid, Seth. And Cain has to go off somewhere because he's got this mark on him and God's mad at him. And Cain's worried about somebody else killing him. Who's going to kill him? Adam? Eve? Well, you know, these stories were not intended to be a genealogy of everybody in the universe. Um, there's, there's, no, there's no line in the story that says, and Adam and Eve were the only people in existence at this time. It just doesn't tell you about that, right? Some people <clears throat> have, have concluded that, well, everything important must be in that story. But that's more of an allegory. Um, it's telling a story that's supposed to be about, a metaphor about what? The in this case, actually in the case of the allegory of the cave and the Cain and Abel story, about the human condition. Cain and Abel's story, it's got a lot of rich ideas to it. You know, um, Cain says things like, am I my brother's keeper? And people still say that to this day. Um, and what are, you know, why does that have these resonances? Because this story is a powerful story. Um, Cain um, is worried about people doing him in. Why? Because he took life himself. There's some sort of general idea there. Um, one of the other things to think about, too, and this, this goes beyond the ethics class, but in this sort of biblical, you know, Judeo-Christian um, understanding of, of the origin of human beings, what's the, what's the first way people die? Murder. At the hands of another human being. So really early on. Um, well, you know... Is this supposed to be a roadmap for every single person's life, you know, mapped out in great detail? No, it's an allegory. Same thing with the allegory of the cave. Um, what's, what's going on in the allegory of the cave? We've got this cave, and what do we have in there? Somebody said it. Prisoners, right. And they're, they're chained. Did any of you look at those um, videos that I, I posted, like the Clay Nation one? If you want to see what this would actually look like, I, I found some things on YouTube where some people actually spent the time to make a claymation of the allegory of the cave, and it's, it's actually pretty good. Um, there's a few other ones that I put in there, and some of them are not quite so good. Um, but, you know, they made an effort. So they're prisoners, and does it tell us what they eat? Uh, does it tell us, you know, what their sleeping arrangements are? No. What do we know about them? What does it tell us? Fire 
Okay, so there's there's a fire uh, above and behind them. And they like can't see it. Right. It why why can't, why can't they see it? Yeah, I don't know. They just don't look up. Well, um, they don't, but it's it's because they they can't see what's behind them because oh, okay. um, they're they're chained. Okay. So imagine people that are sort of chained like this and they're looking at the at the wall. And you know, there's some problems here. How would they eat? How would they go to the bathroom? You know, what if they had an itch? Well, we're not worried about that sort of thing, right? Because again, it's an alley. Um, and what are they watching? Now, there's a fire, you're right. And what's happening behind them? What's that? You, you said something that's on the right track. Um, something like shadows or something. Right. Shadows in front of them. There's people behind them and they're bringing, you know, um, things that cast shadows. And now, who are these people behind them? Well, that's not explained. And we can we can sort of speculate about that, you know, um, later on once we get the basic idea down. So they're looking at these shadows in front of them, and they're all chained together. So they're talking with each other about those shadows. Hey, what about that thing? Hey, look, you know, that shadow's killing that shadow. That shadow's um, pursuing, you know, power. The shadow's eating. Those two shadows are, are um, you know, getting it on. All, all sorts of things, right? They can't see themselves. Now, again, this is, you know, take some imagination. Why couldn't they just turn their heads and look at each other? You know, um, see that, you know, they don't look like shadows. Well, this is this part of the story. Imagine, so imagine all they're seeing is, is what's in front of them. And it, it seems to them very real. Why does it seem to them real? It's the only thing they know. You know, if you um, if you grew up in the countryside, you know, and, and you actually pay attention. To You're not just somebody living in the country who watches TV all the time. And you know, you go outside, you get to know an awful lot about soil and trees and wind and weather and different kinds of grass and what they're good for and what not to touch and what to touch and how animals move and all that sort of stuff. If you're living in the city, you, you may experience some of that. You go to the park, but the, the park is, is not that, that much like that. Um, or think about this great massive river that we've got out here, the Hudson. As far as I know, you can swim in the Hudson, right? Um, that's a big river, though. Uh, is that like going swimming in your little swimming pool? You experience something quite different if you if you go in there. I don't think I'd try to swim across, especially this time of year. Um, what's that? It's a long swim. Well, it's not only a long swim. There's there's all sorts of currents and eddies, and it could be a little bit unpredictable. Um, you learn about these things by by your experience of them. And if, if your only experience is very narrow, that's all you know. And our tendency is to assume that what we know, what we experience, is the whole of reality. Um, now, what happens to this prisoner? For some inexplicable reason, somebody comes along and breaks his chains. And they drag him up, or her up, could be a, could be a woman, right? They drag them up to the outside. How do things go then? Are they happy about that? Yeah. It says at first that they don't really understand what's going on and that they'll still think that their shadows are reality and that they're like, I forget what it said, but seeing something else and it'll take time for them to adjust to it. Very good. Yeah. Um, you, you've all had the experience of going into a dark room for quite a while. Um, maybe some of you who um, play too much video games, you know, and stay inside and don't have a clock. Um, I remember... I had this friend who um, he had his own computer company. He, he had this, uh, he still does. Um, he still is my friend, so I shouldn't use the past tense. Uh, but he had an office, and it was in the middle of this, this factory. No windows or anything like that. And he didn't have a clock in there. And we would go in there, and this is when I was about, you know, 19, 20, 21. And we would play video games. Now, if you don't have a clock, you don't have any way of telling time. You can sit there and play games for 24 hours straight. 
if the game is engaging enough. You can come out, you know, a couple days later and you stumble out and, you know, you're, you're totally, you know, gross because you're, you haven't showered for, you know, 36 hours or so. And you, the sun hits you and it's like a spike in your head, isn't it? Or, you know, think about being hungover. If any of you have experienced being hungover. Waking up the next morning, everything sounds so intense, the lights are so bright. That's what's happening with this guy. This guy has never been outside of the cave. So this is actually much worse. Um, let me read some of it. So he says, um, at first when any of them is liberated and compelled suddenly to stand up and turn his neck around, walk and look towards the light, he will suffer sharp, sharp pains. He will be unable to see the realities of which in his former state he saw the shadows. So when he sees the stuff happening up there, the fire and all that, he's not going to be able to make any sense of that. And then they drag him further up, outside. He's never been outside. He's never seen real things. He's only seen the facsimiles, the duplicates, the shadows, the images of and his instructor is pointing to the objects as they pass and requiring him to name them. He can't name a thing. I don't know what that is. I don't know what you're doing. Who the hell are you? Why are you bothering me like this? Let me go back down to <coughs> the other people. If you make him look at the, the, the lights, he's not going to be able to see anything. So what do you do? You, you go through a, a process almost like rehabilitation. Um, and, you know, we do step-by-step -step stuff for your body. We do it for the mind. We do it for the psyche, you know, your, your, your emotions, if you want to change them, or your attitudes, or things like that. You can't change it all at once. What does this guy do? He starts out looking at what's easiest to see, reflections in, in pools. He, he's not looking at the, the sun itself. He's not looking at the things themselves. Once his eyes get stronger, which they will do, uh, provided, you know, they're not too damaged, he can start looking at actual things. Then eventually he can actually start looking at the sun itself. And this is a huge game for him. And imagine going from, you know, just shadows, two-dimensional things, kind of puppet things, to the real world. Think about, you know, when you've had a great experience in your life where something came along and it took a little while for you to get the hang of it, but it, it changed what you saw and how you how you viewed things, and it was like a revelation to you. And once you get your head around it, a whole world opened up for you. Um, what have you guys experienced like that? I mean, I, I, you know, not to be too crude or anything like that, but I'll tell you one that all of you, you know, experienced. You went through puberty, right? And in puberty, I mean, you were, you know, you were boys and girls, and you were aware of the difference between boys and girls, and you knew something about the anatomy and all that. And then suddenly, you were flooded with all these hormones, and they made you, you know, do things like grow and get hair, and you know, and your voice deepen, or you know, grow uh, in certain ways and all that. Um, but it also gave you very intense feelings, right? You started having much more attachments, attractions, embarrassments, all these sorts of things, your world opened up by becoming um, aware of the mystery of sexuality. Now that's just a bodily thing, right? I mean, it does involve the mental, the spiritual, right? Um, think of this now in terms of an even greater awakening. That's what's happening with this guy. What happens then? So now he's, he's very happy. Um, that's not where the story ends, is it? What happens next? Does he stay up there? Yeah. He goes back down to the cave and tries to like, tell everyone <coughs> of what yeah. he's seen, and they're just completely in disbelief and don't they can't believe him, and they don't want to believe him, and they kind of, like, if they could, they would, like, shut him. Yeah, you're right. I'll read you the 
section he says, um, They're in the habit of conferring honors among themselves on those who are quickest to observe the passing shadows and to remark which of them went before and which followed after. He can't compete with them, right? Because his eyes are used to real stuff, and they're used to looking at this, this uh, fake stuff, which is hard to see. Um, and he says, um, imagine what, such a one coming suddenly out of the sun to be replaced in his old situation. Would he not be certain to have his eyes full of darkness? You go, you know, you go from the full sunlight into, you've all done this, full sunlight into a dark room, you can't see anything for a while, right? And if you stay in there long enough, your eyes will adjust again, and you'll be able to make things out. But when he makes things out, they're going to seem very different to him. Um, they're, they're, he's not going to be having as much fun looking at the images, because he knows they're fake. He knows that they're not um, as good as the things that are there outside. And then it says, um, if there was a contest and he had to compete in measuring the shadows of the prisoners who'd never moved out of the den, while his sight was still weak, and before his eyes had become steady, would he not be ridiculous? Ridiculous means laughable. Um, somebody who's worthy of, of being made fun of. Uh, men would say of him that up he went and down he came without his eyes, and that it was better not to even think of ascending. And if anyone tried to loose another and lead him up to the light, they would put him to death. Because, you know, in their view, this, this does make sense, doesn't it? Good, bless you. Good practical reasoning. If you, if you see somebody doing something, um, well, let, let's take, for example, um, in, in our society and in many other societies, what we call psychotropic drugs are, are controlled substances. Um, and some of the people who are really big on them, things like LSD or peyote or mushrooms, so, oh man, yeah, it opened up a whole world to me. I could like smell colors and you know all this sort of stuff. And and you know, my generation, a lot of a lot of my friends, because I hung out with all the burnouts, used um, those sort of drugs. And they would tell me about their experiences. And you know, one of the reasons I never used that sort of stuff is I didn't find their descriptions really that interesting. I, I would say, so you smell colors, okay. But some of them, you know, some other people would, would say, well, you know, you walk along, you see all these, you know, the rainbows and things like that. Um, and now, bad things can happen, too. I, I had a girlfriend who had a, um, a bad trip, and for, for a long time, she saw wolves coming out of the walls to eat her, and, and she never took that stuff again, um, which is, you know, smart. Other people would say, though, and this is back in the generation before mine. Oh, it you know, opens up your mind so you can perceive reality as it really is. Um, now, we, we can have a metaphysical debate about whether that actually takes place. Let's say it's not actually the case. Let's say that what's happening is just a bunch of neurons firing in your head and making you see you know, bright colors and you know, things jumbled up in there. And that if you do enough of it, it burns your brain out, which, which is actually true. Um, well, then there's probably a good reason for making it illegal, right? <laughs> Which is what they do. If you think that that's the case, then you should probably make it illegal. If you think that, that doing philosophy makes people into worse people, then if somebody wants to propose having all of you study philosophy, you should hang them or run them out of town. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, I don't think that anything really opens your mind up to how everything really is, but even if you do a drug or something, it doesn't open your mind. It just gives you a different perspective that maybe you never thought of. Yeah. And, okay. you know, a lot of times, yeah, it's probably, you know, bogus, you know, according to smelling colors and stuff. But if you have a different perspective on something, maybe it will give you a new idea about something. Yeah, you know... Um I don't want to go into a long thing about, about drugs here. Well, not but classifying just the drugs, I mean, so that yeah. thing, if you get a new perspective. Well, I was thinking about, like, say, ecstasy, right? Um, ecstasy was originally developed in order to facilitate um, psychological work. Yeah. And then it got abused, right? People are taking it for all sorts of other reasons. Why do people take ecstasy um, 
at, at raves and parties and stuff like that because it makes people um, more open to physical sensations and it, it mellows their, their mood out so they're, they're more willing to hang out with a bunch of strangers who they don't know uh, until you know, that day and have a good time. And maybe that could actually open your path to having new experiences. I mean, if you're kind of a closed-in person, I'm not suggesting anybody take ecstasy. I want to make that very clear. I'm just speaking hypothetically. If you were kind of a closed-in person and you went to some party and you weren't having a good time because you feel like, I don't know anybody here, you know, then maybe taking ecstasy would open that up and then you'd find out that you actually have something in common with these people who, you know, look like a bunch of... Uh, neo hippies, you know, or not? I, I don't know. But you know, there's a lot of things like that. And you're right; it doesn't have to be drugs. It could be going to anger management class. <laughs> you know? uh, it could be going fishing with somebody. It could be all sorts of things that widen your range of experience. With this allegory of the cave, what we're talking about, what Plato's talking about, is seeing realities as they they truly are. And what we're interested in for for ethics is two things. One is a question. Um, let's say that the allegory of the cave actually holds. And let's say it, it, it has to do with our condition, that we're originally in a state like the cave, that we think we know what we're engaging with, and that when it, when it comes to ethics, um, we're, you know, kind of in a muddle. We're, we're caught up in this situation where we all talk a lot about this sort of stuff, like, for instance, an execution that took place last night, right? Uh, we talked about this a little bit before class, Troy Davis. On my Twitter feed, I don't know, any of you use Twitter? A few of you? Okay. You guys use Facebook probably more, right? So, a lot of my friends are posting on Facebook, oh, this is a travesty, ethics this, ethics that, you know? All sorts of people talking about it. And it's kind of interesting. Alistair McIntyre has noted that in our society, um, we tend not to talk about ethics before something happens. We tend to talk about an occasion by particular circumstances. And then everybody starts sounding off. But a lot of that is just like the shadows in the cave, quite frankly. It's not based on any sort of well-thought-out principles. Um, a lot of it is just sort of, you know, gut feelings and people, you know, being for this and being for that. Some people were, were you know, saying things like, the death penalty is terrible, you know, and then this, this <coughs> trope about um, corporations, I'll believe corporations are people when Texas starts executing them, you know, all this sort of stuff. People are getting very inflamed about this. You know, somebody else was executed last night, too. I mentioned this before. I, for, I forgot his name. Um, and I, I've got, also forgot the name of his victim. But he's one of the guys who chained another man behind his pickup truck and dragged him until he died. Um, and I didn't see a lot of people protesting about that. But if, you know, if, if Troy Davis's execution is such a terrible thing and it's a sign why we shouldn't have capital punishment at all and all this stuff, you'd think that would apply to this case too. Right? But that's not what we see. The shadows on the wall focus on, on this thing right here, and they don't get into the depth of it. They don't really go into the principles of it. Um, what were you going to say? I mean, I didn't know about the other guy, mm -hmm. uh, the second one or something, but I feel like it was because it was an innocent man. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> like, I feel that, I mean, I don't really care much about politics, but when it comes to someone who's innocent and not being taken, like, that's part of why so many more. So many more people were outraged and got more news story because it was an innocent man who was killed last night. Yeah, and that makes for good good news. Um, and but there are innocent people killed every day all over the place. And so why this this particular case? Well, that's the shadow that got up on, on the wall this time around. And it, yeah. Yeah, but it's not like it's like all the people that we would to guide us our laws and all this are the ones that killed them. Sure. Keep, keep going. Like when your father turns around and disciplines you or something, and, you know, gives you a snack or something, you, you become, you know, flustered, you know, what, what just happened. 
Yeah. So it's a different. What we're, what we're starting to do right here <coughs> is to come out of the cave. This is what Plato calls dialectic where we're starting to talk about things in terms of general principles and not just this case, right? Well, when an innocent person, whoever it happens to be, is, is uh, put to death, something terrible is taking place. This is uh, the state doing it, and how does that compare to a father doing it? You, know, you notice Socrates does exactly that sort of thing. He'll say, here's a case. What would it be like if we use this example? What's it like if we use this example? That helps to pull us out of the cave, where we're just concerned with the, the images that are being thrown at us. Um, and we don't have much control over which images we get placed in, in front of us. Um, if, you, you know, if you think about this cave thing, Plato, of course, didn't know anything about TV. It didn't exist at his time. Um, or media, or, or anything like that. We live surrounded by it. And that's very much like living in a cave. That's why the picture that I took in I Learn, uh, you know, the allegory of the cave is a bunch of people sitting around a television and they've all got television heads. Um, in order to get out of the cave, we have to engage in dialectic. We have to look at general principles. Uh, and that's part of what we do in this class. And that's part of what, if you want to be making good ethical decisions, somewhere along the line, you have to be able to do. You have to be able to articulate not just how you feel at this time, or how this one case is this way at this one time, but the broader general principles. Now, Plato has a, a whole theory about this, which I'm not going to go into here. I, I talk about that in, in Intro to Philosophy, and I, I'll be recording that lecture too. So if you're interested in Plato's theory of the forms, then that sort of stuff, I can give you the link to that. Um, as far as the ethics class goes, I don't think we need to worry so much about, about that as about this general idea that you get out of the cave by, by thinking these things through in general ways, by moving away from just your story. Remember the McIntyre thing? You have your questions. What is my good? How do I achieve that good? That's the particular. The universal is what is the good for human beings? And we, we frame these things universally doing moral theory, eventually. And you go back and forth, right? And then you should. You're, you're not existing just <coughs> as a person outside of the cave, only looking at the realities themselves. I think Plato's a little bit maybe off in that respect. Although you notice, and here's, so here's the second question. He comes back to the cave. Should he? Let, let's think about this in terms of an actual decision to make. Let's say this whole story is true, right? Um, it's very pleasant being outside of the cave, isn't it? You get to see things as they really are, and they're beautiful. You, know, you get to see a whole new dimension of reality that was being kept from you before. Think about, uh, how many of you like music of one form or another? Um, <coughs> think about the things you like in music. And imagine having those taken away from you. So that all you hear from now on whenever music plays is wah 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 something like that. You you become tone deaf. think about how impoverished your life would be. How many of you listen to music, say at least three hours a day? At least on the background. How many of you would, <clears throat> if you had to go several days without listening to music, would, would, would feel sad? So think about this. You know, in the allegory of the cave, this guy is seeing things as they are. Um, he's going to go back inside there and, and look at shadows and talk with people <clears throat> who, at least right now, are only talking about shadows. Wouldn't it be better for him to stay outside of the cave? Some of you are nodding your heads. Yeah. I think, I mean, if he already got out of the cage, I don't, like, if he likes it out there, he should stay out there, but I don't think he should, like, go back inside and tell people they should come out. He shouldn't? He shouldn't. Why not? Because that's the reality for them, and that's, like, what they've seen. But isn't it better to be exposed to, 
you know, what's really there, if you're, if you're being deceived. <coughs> but they don't know anything else, so I guess, they, like, they're happy where they are. Okay, so you leave them in their, in their ignorance, ignorance is bliss, that sort of thing. Yeah. I can say, I mean, ignorance is bliss, but I think you guys should uh, tell them, because it's like, for us, our politicians, I mean, they hide so much stuff from us, yeah. but, like, it's better, we rather know than not know whether it, like, we should just know, because if it's out there, it's out there for a reason. So why spend your life in this little okay. cave when this, you can be happier out there and exploring and educating yourself? Yeah. So notice in the story, he's motivated not necessarily from a sense of duty, but from a sense of pity. Yeah. Uh, it's like when you learn, like, say one person who's a common person, not a government, not a politician, yeah. learn something has been going on uh -huh. within the government and then in turn relays it to everybody. Yeah. You know, publicizes it, puts it in the media. It's kind of the same situation because you made something that wasn't there before that you have came to the realization that is, it, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing or the other. And you're allowing the, your people, the people like you, yeah. on the other side of the fence to understand what's actually going on. Yeah, we often talk about it in terms of empowering people by giving them information, right? Um, and if the information, if the information doesn't really matter, then yeah, leave them, leave them in the cave, let them do whatever they want. If, it, if it's stuff that actually could affect their lives, then maybe, maybe it's better to educate people. Maybe it's better to lead them out of the cave. <coughs> um, certainly if it's ethics. If the way that we tend to do ethics is pretty sloppy and not very good, and sort of you know ad hoc, put together on, on, on the basis of you know, whatever we can come up with at the time, which is pretty much what happens, isn't it, in real life, for most people? Um, then maybe those who actually have you know gone out of the cave and studied these things should. Be um, Plato, um, one second. Plato actually says, you know, if nobody actually helped you out of the cave. Or, you know, society didn't help you out of the cave. Yeah, stay out of the cave. The hell with those people down there. You don't owe them anything. Now, if society has helped you out of the cave, in some way, say through education, which is what education, this is, this is a little story about education, um, then maybe you have a duty to go back in. And so in his ideal city, he makes the guardians go out of the cave, there's a whole class of people, and then he makes them come back in. He says, you can't stay up there. You have to come back down here. But notice, they're not, they're not coming in to lead other people out of the cave, except for other guardians. They're coming back in to help rule with, within the cave, because they've seen the realities. Now they can, they can make better sense of the shadows. So the shadows are still there. It's just now there's people who can, can tie them in and say, that's, an act that's actually a shadow of this. And here's what we know about, about this, yeah. I was just going to say, yeah, out of pity, maybe you might want to say, okay, you know, you guys, you know, might be interested in, you know, checking to see what's outside of the cave and stuff, but I don't think he has any moral obligation to try to convince them of something that they don't want to do. I mean, as soon as they said, no, we like it in here, we're used to it, I mean, he could have no, they're, they're, they're going to say, we're going to kill you if you keep talking like too. Yeah, I mean, they said, I would have just left and said, all right, fine. You know, I let you guys know of a nice opportunity. <laughs> didn't like it, you know, see you later. You know, a nice you opportunity. That's not fair, but what are you going to say? Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, I was actually thinking, um, like, yeah, it's true we can educate them, um, like, while we're already home. And it's good, like, to go back and, like, let them see what I already, um, like, seen, but sometimes, like, they're not, like, in this case, they're not, they just going to still, like, they're ignorant about it. Yeah. Let me, let me <clears throat> change the question up a little bit. Let's say you're the prisoner, you've gotten out of the cave, you know that if you go back into the cave, you'll only be able to pull one person out of the cave. The rest of them are going to be stuck there. Um, should you do it? Is, is it worth it to do it for just one bringing one person out of the cave? Can that one person go back and take out another one? Yes. Good, good question. Um, if they want to, let's say, let's make it even tougher though. You don't have a, you don't get to tell them that you have to go back in. 
they, they might say, ah, I just want to stay out of the cave and, and look at the beautiful realities. Um, is it worth it? Yeah. It's worth it because, I mean, they're going to see that, I mean, hopefully. Yeah. The way I'm thinking, they're going to see that you went back out and, and got them so that I could return a favor and pay it forward. But it's yeah. worth it if, come on, they get to, like, be free. Like, they don't have to be in that little cave. But Go ahead. You don't know what's the reality to our person. You know, you can't really trust them because you don't know if they're going to do the same thing as you. You still um, want the shot. See, the, the real question here is, is it only important because you, know, you generate this thing of pulling people out, you know? One person does it, so another person does it. Or is there something worthwhile in just getting out of the cave itself? You know? If there is, then, then any person getting pulled out of the cave is a good thing. I, I remember I went through this myself when I was a graduate student again. Um, one of my professors, who is a very old man who I read Plato with in, in Greek, so I didn't do it in the philosophy department, I did it in the classics. And I was going through this thing that a lot of people do. You may go through something like this in your life, where you say, okay, so I'm going to study all this stuff so I can somehow make it part of my life, and then I'm going to pass it on to other people, and what's going to determine whether I, you know, whether my life had any value or what I pass on to other people. But what if they don't pass their stuff on to anybody else? Or what if nobody wants what I have to offer? You know, then I've just wasted. You know, this is in grad school, so I was about halfway through. I just wasted, you know, four years of undergrad and three or four years of, of graduate school. I'll be wasting the rest of my life. Um, just one second. Um, and what he said to me is, first of all, he said, I went through that myself. It's always a good thing to, to learn, isn't it? That somebody else went through something similar. Because it tells you there's, there's an out on the other side. And he said, this is the way I look at it. There's a fire. And I'm tending that fire. And if somebody else wants to come and warm themselves by the fire, that's good. And if somebody else wants to stay after I'm done and keep the fire going, that's even, that's even better. But if nobody does anything, and I'm the only one sitting here by the fire, I still got the fire, and I'm doing the right thing in the process. So by teaching Plato, this is him talking, by teaching Plato, even if none of my students ever get it, this is still worthwhile. That, that's, that's what he said, and I found that very helpful to me. That's sort of like this issue of, if you pull somebody out of the cave, let's say they don't go back. Let's say they say, ah, eh, screw all those other people. A bunch of dummies sitting there looking at shadows. Um, you've still done a good thing to take them out of the cave, haven't you? So if you educate people, if you, if you lead them to become better ethical decision makers by, by looking at principles, um, even if they don't pass that on to other people, that's not where the real value is. The real value is getting outside the cave. What were you going to say? Uh, just based on what you same with the old fire thing, so nowhere near as good. You have the same guy? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to end with, with, with that for Plato. I, I want to talk a little bit about Aristotle before we end this, this class session. So Aristotle was Plato's student, right? And what I really want to talk about here is how different the text is going to be that you're going into, the Nicomachean Ethics, from the Republic. The Republic was a dialogue where people are talking back and forth. You've got characters that you can identify with that. And you've got multiple sides being presented, right? And I think when you were reading the Republic, at least for the first time, you may have had a hard time figuring out who was saying what. Yes? No? And sometimes the characters would say things, and you would realize afterwards that's not what they really think. Yeah, you had that experience too? They're saying, well, you're saying this, or Simonides says this, or somebody says this, but what I really think is, is this. Or even Cephalus, you know, other old men say this, but here's where they're going wrong. It's a little bit easier with a, a dialogue to figure out who's talking and to distinguish these different points of view from each other, because you've got characters you can tie into. With Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, it's going to seem very confusing to you the first time you read it, and the second time that you read it. 
because you're going to say he jumps all over the place and he's you know flitting from topic to topic to topic. Aristotle will actually, at some points in the text, start talking about one thing and then he moves into something else. Then he'll say, "Coming back to my point," which means that you actually have to like correlate those those parts together. And I'm going to try to help you with that, but you have to do that as well. Aristotle in, in Nicomachean Ethics Book 1 is going to be looking at a lot of different viewpoints on what is the good life? What is the point of doing the things that we do? What is, you know, what is the, um, the end, as he calls it, that we're pursuing? That's going to guide ethical decision making. That's going to guide what we want to be doing. We have to think about this carefully. But he's not going to give you the answer right away. The way Aristotle begins, he says, let's look at what everybody says. Let's look at the wide range of possibilities. So he's not going to give you the answer until about halfway through book one. And then he's going to clarify it some more. He's going to say, well, happiness. Happiness is what we're actually after. But what's happiness? Well, some people say this, some people say this, some people say this. And you're going to wonder, why don't you just cut to the chase, Aristotle? You know, shut up about these other people and tell us what you actually think. Isn't that a reasonable thing to say to somebody who's going to talk, well, you know, you ask them a question, so-and-so says this, so-and-so says this, so, you know, I didn't ask you what so-and-so said, I asked you what you think. <coughs> That's not the way Aristotle works. There's a reason for that. Um, and, and this may not make sense to you right up, right away. It may take a while for this to sink in. Why do you look at what everyone else has to say? What, you know, think of, forget philosophy, forget ethics. Um, you're going to buy a car. You don't just, I hope you don't just go out to the lot and like, you know, pick the first thing that you see according to your feelings. Because that's a really bad way to buy a car. You talk with people, right? Who do you talk to? Car salesman, but they're not the person you want to find out from, are they? They're trying to sell you a car. Who do you talk to? You talk to a bunch of people and you get their takes. Do they all see things the same way? So what do you do when you get a bunch of different people's takes? You come up with your own conclusion. You come up with your own, but how do you do that? I mean, if, if you if you just came up with your own, why bother with listening to anybody else? I'm saying, when you gather information from other people, you come up with, with your own, like, um, let's say I get your opinion, your opinion, and yeah. then I come up with, like, um, You're on the right track. Keep, keep going with it. <laughs> Um, what do you do with their opinions that has to do with how, how you come up with your own? There's a reason why you, you care about what they think. Yeah, because they obviously will know um, more than I do. Okay, very good. So when you check out what everyone else has to say, you may not accept everything that they say, but you take bits from this part where they're right. Bits from this part where they're right. You don't have to, as we say, reinvent the wheel every time. And it's the same way in ethics. People have been thinking about this stuff for a very, very long time. We don't have to come up with our own new great system of ethics. We can see what other people have said. And, and if they were right about something, let's let's take that. Let's make that our own. That's what Aristotle's going to do. So I'll see all of you uh, Monday. Have a good week.